su sangre. ¿Cómo nos metemos siempre en esta mierda? ¡Retrocedan! ¡Toma esto! ¡Maldición! ¡Súbeme a tejado! ¡Gracias, Laila! ¡Más vale que tengas un plan, Jacob! ¡No fallar! Entonces, ¿fue divertido? Welcome to Redfall. Redfall is our effort to take what Arcane does well, a hybrid of uh, first-person games and RPGs, and stretch ourselves a little bit. Uh, does this work in the open world? Does it work both solo and with co-op players? Uh, can we take all our narrative layers and our improvisational mechanics and our style um, and spread that out across an open world? For me, Redfall represents our most ambitious title that we've tried to do here in the Austin studio ever. It was super important for us to you know, let players still play by themselves and have that sort of like immersive arcane experience, but, uh, but then adding three other players, up to three other players into the mix, of course, changes everything. Not only from the player experience standpoint, but just from develop, the development standpoint also. The, the reason I like making the kind of games that we make is because I like playing these kind of games, right? And so like, uh, it's the same reason I like tabletop RPGs too. Um, and it's, it's the, the allure of like, I want to witness and then mess with some dramatic scene. I want to come upon these tableaus and, and sort of like almost ant farm-like, like see what's going on, hear what they're saying, try to suss out what they're doing, and then I want to like jack with it in some way, you know, like to <laughs> turn the vampire loose on them or put explosives down or snipe them from a distance, you know, or see some cultist fortress like real far away and try to figure out how am I going to get in there? You know, what's, what am I going to find when I get in there? You know, that kind of stuff is like super enticing to me. Some of my favorite moments are just like the sort of observation about how the world changes, the way we spawn different little vignettes across the world, and you catch people at different points on their patrol route, and day-night changes things, and uh, it's, uh, that's a powerful piece to me. It's like, wow, I feel like I'm in a living world. Yeah. I'm really excited about the setting of the town of Redfall. You know, it's like a lot of games you think it's not New York, it's not, you know, London or Boston or whatever, you know, it's, it's, it's quaint, it's small. Even though it's our biggest <laughs> game, it's, uh, it feels like small town Americana. And, you know, to your point, Harvey, with the time of day, like that you can run through this open world so many different times, but based on the time of day, based on different like weather, if the fog has rolled in, it can feel so dramatically different each time. And with the, the random spawning, it's you're constantly on your toes and in awe of some of the ways that the world looks. I really gravitated toward a lot of the narrative that's in the world. You know, the, the readables and getting just caught up and just like, I'm gonna read this thing now. And, or like walking through the Ford encampment and seeing a, a framed newspaper and then getting close and realizing there's the full story is actually right. there. It's something that makes and, sense. Yeah, and then you turn around and that person they're talking about is in this picture frame behind yeah. us. Um, that and the forcing myself to take different approaches. Uh, I specifically remember kind of going through and I have my one way I go for the first mission every time. This is the way I go, across yeah. this bridge, go up there. Watching somebody else go down uh, into the lake bed and there's a cave there that I had no idea. It just like completely blew my mind. Oh, under kinda, the chopper's crash? Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I was even thinking as I was watching them, they're going the wrong way. That's not how you, <laughs> that's not how you go. But they kind of changed how I approach everything now where I feel yeah. like I, I have the way that I think about and then I'm you know, actually going to go this way this time and it feels compelling to do that. So. If I could add anything to that, or if I could put it into one word, it would probably be like uh, transported. Like we put so much effort into the narrative, into the world building, environmental storytelling, all that stuff that I, and it's part of the reason the games that I gravitate towards make me feel that way, you know. Uh, so I hope players feel like they've been transported to some place that like feels real at the end of the day. Yeah, it's like that moment in time that you're, you're, you feel these people have existing relationships that you're kind of being a part of. They're not just, people just happen to pop up, you know, randomly. Yep. And uh, one word we've used for this game throughout the whole time is spooky. You know, we're not like a horror game, so I hope people, there's not jump scares yeah. per se, right? Like there may it's have no been mimics. a few. Yeah, it's <laughs> like a visit with a few and pray. <laughs> but uh, so I hope people feel like, you know, they can take the time to explore, but they also, there is still that edge that there could be anything right around the corner. So you're not necessarily standing up in your seat uh, from fear, but hopefully there's that little bit of spooky element that you just never know what you're going to encounter. 
the story of Redfall begins with this idea that these like really smart, wealthy biotech entrepreneurs came to the island. They weren't from the island originally. They bought up some property and they started doing some research into like longevity experiments and life extension and things like that. Probably seen stuff like that in the news <laughs> recently with people doing weird stuff with biotech startups. But and that, you know, uh, started to go south really quickly, get a little like morally questionable, you know, without giving spoilers away. The, the end result was they turned themselves into vampires. And one of the distinctives uh, about our game is that the vampires in our game and the vampirism that they have is not, uh, it's not a disease, it's not an accident, it's not something that you can cure. Uh, it's not like, oops, I got a cold and let me take this medicine and get rid of it and now I'm back to my normal kind self or whatever. The people who became vampires and the people who become vampires in our game, in a sense, they already were vampires on the inside, right? It's more like a metamorphosis, not a disease that they caught. And so it is it's definitely this like horrible evil that's like taken hold of the island that needs to be resisted and, and fought. Uh, not, it's, they're not innocent people that you're trying to save. And they slowly, like a frog boiling water, they slowly took over the town and consolidated all the power. And that's where players find themselves now at the beginning of the game. We wanted to do something that was recognizable as vampires, but uh, but also a fresh take um, or a less common take. Um, so, you know, if they don't have fangs and they're not afraid of the sun and they don't drink blood, then they're not vampires. They have to have those elements to be vampires, basically. Um, but we wanted our vampires to be derived from science. Um, but we wanted to avoid the crosses, garlic, uh, running water kind of stuff in, in lieu of like, uh, these are vampires that wanted this to happen to them. They wanted to live forever, even at the expense of other people, even if it requires the blood of others. They're horrible monsters. None of them are romantic interests or you know, <laughs> aspirational. Well, you know? they, they are. I mean, maybe you're into they're them. Like they're, they're, they're beautiful. <laughs> uh, most yeah. of them are beautiful. They're aspirational. It's like what they envision themselves that they're just right. they're great it's like their own ideal exactly. self they're which is manifesting uh fancy clothes and you know they're they're stylish it's like what they they themselves envision themselves as idealized predators yeah, yeah. and people who play the game will see the ecology of the sort of bootlicking cultists that follow them that want to be made vampires and um you know the the, the humans that have been converted the vampires can modify them in different ways uh, none of, not all of them become vampires, uh, nothing as grandiose as that. Some of them become like different types of familiars that are part of the gameplay ecology. All the way up to the vampires and then sort of like specialized versions, named versions, like the vampire underbosses and things like that. And then we have a series of vampire gods which are the most twisted, most changed by the whole process. Uh, and those serve as sort of chapter breakpoints across the game. Um, and the gods are, the vampire gods are like the, they have the most power. They're the ones trapping you on the island, right? They've pushed the waters back. They've, they're the ones that have blacked out the sun. Um, they're, uh, they're tremendously powerful. I really latched onto the idea of them being dangerous people regardless. Kind of like you were saying, like they're, they're irredeemable in that. They're, they're just being unleashed and you know, they're, you're storing their true self at this point, right? For me, the, uh, the cult just gave me a really nice view into the vampires because you know, we were talking about how they've already kind of be become their worst self. But I think through some of the conversations with the cult is you get to discover what that actually means right. and just how horrible you have to be to even just get to that point. <laughs> so yeah, and then you can still end up not being a vampire at the end of the day, so. yep. which is in some ways showing the mirror of how they are really awful because they may not still turn into the vampire. Yeah, like, uh, Harvey touched on this a little bit a second ago, but like the the vampires, uh, you know, first of all, the the cultist has to want to become a vampire, and then the vampires have to share some of their blood with them, and so like you know, so I always picture that like some of the cultists are like, I hope I get turned into like a really badass vampire, and then I can do whatever I want, but the vampires can choose instead to turn them into these other horrible things, uh, like one of them is called a blood bag, which is just like this grotesque creature that it's like. It's like a, a vampiric version of a milk cow, but it's just, it just produces like excess, you know, bloated amounts of blood for the vampires to, to sip on whenever they're a little thirsty. But I love the, the writing for the blood bags is that they exalt in it. They right. love it. Yeah. You know, like, look look at me, I'm gorgeous. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. 
The four heroes that you get to pick from to play, we deliberately, you know, we set out to, to say some of them are from the island, some of them are outsiders coming into the island, so you have multiple perspectives. And they represent this like spectrum of like different backgrounds, different play styles. Like, uh, you know, if you're, like I gravitate towards Jacob, who is like um, probably more stealth oriented because he's got the ability to turn invisible. He's kind of got uh, sniper type skills. He's got a raven that can scout for him. And all the way on the other end of the spectrum, you've got somebody super wacky like Devinder, who's like uh, got a bunch of crazy gadgets um, that allow him to do bizarre things like, you know, uh, plant uh, javelins in the ground that spark lightning everywhere or teleport around. Um, or he can, he has a black light power that lets him freeze everyone. So he's got a lot of like uh, area of effect abilities and personality wise, he's just like, uh, he's just super gregarious and interesting and just like zany character. He's the internet famous, you know, cryptid hunter. Um, so I think there's like, with the four heroes, there's a little bit of something for everyone. Um, you know, depending on what your play style is and what kind of you gravitate towards in terms of like personality. Yeah, and the funny thing about Devender is I think he actually wants to be on the island to be researching what's happening. Yeah, that's true. He's, he's happy that, <laughs> and so, at some level, he's happy that something crazy like this is happening because it validates his like theories or whatever. I think it's also fun to think about who and why are they on the island? You know, like Layla was living here, she was a college student. Uh, Devender was here for a book signing, right? Lucky him to actually have some content to capture. Uh, Remy, you know, from some of the tricklings of some weirdness happening, she's here because of her search and rescue uh, skill set. And Jacob initially with Bellwether, so. Jacob was one of the bad guys. You know, yeah. <laughs> so to have such, to really think about really different reasons for these characters to be here on the island and then build up from that was fun as well. I think something I struggled with initially but I've come to really appreciate is that they're not they're not a kit. This isn't just this is the tank and then this is the healer and this is this. You know, there there's so much nuance to how you play each of these characters. Like, you know, Devinder it would be real easy just to say he's the gadget guy, but that doesn't really encapsulate everything that he can do. He has a little bit of crowd control, a little bit of traversal, you know, and then like a you know, a big AoE um, versus like uh, you know, Remy has you know Brabon with her, and that kind of has a, a lot going on there. Um, but then also has you know her sticky bomb, and like um, that that's really given me a lot of like joy to kind of discover how I want to play these characters and beyond just like the, the high level summary of them. So as you're playing through the game, uh, of course, there are, um, you know, we've come up with a suite of like really cool abilities and powers for players to choose from, just like we did in Prey and Dishonored. You have uh, tons of options. Um, and if, you know, if you happen to be playing as like, like if we all decide to play Layla's or Jacob's, um, you know, my Jacob might not be the same as yours because um, I may I may choose to like really drill down into the the, the Raven skill tree and like max that out um, before I pick any of the other skills. Um, so you got a lot of choice there um, to like express different play styles. Um, that's the skill trees, but then of course you've also got your gear. Like we've got special things called remnants you can find, which are like basically magical vampire blood <laughs> that you can equip almost as like a talisman that uh, will give you special uh, resistances or special abilities related to healing, uh, but it also boosts, you know, uh, your health. Uh, so there's lots of different ways that you can sort of customize your, your character's build. Yeah, and there's also ways for your friends to, if you've leveled up certain skills to a certain point, that your friends get to benefit from them. Yeah. Like, I can, if you're playing Jacob and you level up Cloak to a certain point, I actually can Cloak as well. Yes. We, we tried to not make it so that, like, this skill only works in multiplayer, or this skill only is useful in single player, but, like, but the, it has the single player benefit, but then it has the multiplayer like add. And if you happen to be playing with friends, it, it does cool stuff for your friends too, which I think is going to be super fun. I thought as like in a horde shooter, like they're coming for you at all times. So you, have, you yeah. feel that pressure. And in this game, I feel like like I'm the danger kind of thing, right? right. I'm the one who's moving through. <laughs> You're trapped yeah, in the room with me. Yeah. <laughs> it's, in, it's also important. that That's a great point. And it's important to note that like, they're unaware of you. So you can zoom in and eavesdrop on their conversations. You can sneak up and listen to two people talk and then slip away from the encounter. Uh, you know, it's, it's, it shares the lineage of arcane games in that sense. 
Yeah, that's something that's also been nice about the vampires being the, the antagonists is that they're not mindless. They're not just, let me run and eat your brain, right? right. So they're actually thoughtful. They are a bit more of a predator. Uh, and also humans are terrifying, right? So the cultists <laughs> and Bellwether are, they're, they're, they're also more tactical. They so yeah, they take cover, you know, they flank you, all those good things. Well, the, the other thing is like, this is an open world game. You're never trapped in like, I'm not trapped in this alley and I have to defeat 30, you know. It's gonna hold creep. out. Yeah, I don't have to hold out. Like I can do the thing that I do in uh, other um, open world games, which is like, this monster's too hard, I'm leaving. <laughs> and I'm gonna go fight these other monsters over here, get a new weapon, level up, and then I'm gonna come back and kick this guy's ass. When we started uh, Redfall, we knew we needed like, you know, guns because this is part RPG, part shooter. Um, and it was fun to be able to work with modern guns for once. Um, and, you know, we, we wanted a range from like high-end military gear dropped by Bellwether security on the island, all the way down to like grandpa's shotgun found in the attic uh, of this old Victorian house. Um, and then some kit bash stuff too, like in his garage, this, this person made like, you know, a duct tape handgun that, you know, has a flashlight on it or something, right? So there's, there's the, ranging from jury rig to high-end military and all that. Um, but very quickly we realized we also needed some vampire specific weapons. And so the UV beam, which leads to a whole system of petrifying the vampires from which they can thaw out if you don't, if you don't stake them. The uh, stake launcher itself, which is like a found ammo type weapon, like broken off pool cues and snapped off mop handles and fireplace pokers and things like that. Stake knives. <laughs> yeah, and then like flare guns, which you'd find on a, a tourist island with sailboats and all. Uh, they emulate vampires, and so they become like a little fireball launcher. Uh, and so the usual weapons that you that you love in games, sniper rifles and shotguns and uh, assault rifles and things like that are fun to play with in our game. And they level up over time, and they have different traits on them, and so you're looking for the one with the right traits that you want. And they have stakes on the end, of course, because you need to be yeah. like stake vampires. Right, again, every time we tweak our fiction in some way, like vampires, it leads to whole systems like staking and petrification with UV light and all that. But, but in addition to all those guns, we have the, the set of vampire specific guns that are, that are you know, unique to the game. The best stake attachment in the game is the, uh, is the garden gnome. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you don't partial. like the broken guitar knife? <laughs> oh, the broken guitar knife. I'm partial to the harpoon. Mm -hmm. It looks like a wailing yeah. harpoon that's been cut off and put on the end of the rifle, so. We start with something really uh, weird uh, and fantastic, right? Like Dunwall or Space Station. And then we work to make it uh, so the players can understand the space and uh, learn about the environment. But this time we started with something familiar on purpose. Like everybody gets like a small town, you know, on the East Coast. Everybody understands liquor stores and convenience stores and clinics and neighborhoods. Uh, so that part is awesome because you're immediately dropped into something you understand, but then the, the part that I like is then we twist it, right? The vampires, uh, they have, they warp reality around them with their psychic abilities. So uh, the cultists, of course, build weird structures on top of the familiar settings that you'll encounter occasionally. And then the vampires like punch these holes uh, through reality and make these little pocket dimensions where they like sleep and gather power. Uh, and those spaces are some of my favorite because it's, everything's just like bent and twisted into this like sort of Halloween slash nightmare version of reality. And speaking to the size, I think the Talos and Prey was five football fields and the size of Breathfall was kind of hold my beer on that one. Uh, <laughs> so we definitely challenged the whole team with making something this big. Yeah. I remember early on there was a moment we were working on District 2 which is a little more rural and uh, Jim McGill took Talos at scale and <laughs> dropped it in the middle of the farm that's there and the district just eats the whole space station of course it's gigantic it was just the size of the actual like farm oh, area yeah and that's just like one mission yeah that's pretty crazy ultimately we hope that players will play single player if that's what they want and it will feel like an arcane game um, but it's more expansive it's an open world but it's not an open world based on the scale of vehicles it's an open world based on foot and so it's yeah. like a familiar setting, New England, spooky, traverse the, the, the place, go into mom and pop grocery stores, apartments, get on the roof of buildings, 
and we try to put as many environmental storytelling scenes around as we possibly can. Um, and so it just feels very lived in. I think the thing that's compelling to me about the open world, and this is true in other open world games that I love, but um, is just like how easily the player can get distracted, <laughs> you know, with like some other wondrous thing or some interesting point of interest. Like you always set out with like, I have this goal in mind. I'm going, you know, to the shipyard or the farm to uh, rescue this person or collect this thing. That's my mission. But like, it takes me two hours to get there because uh, along the way, like a nest popped up or I saw a vignette with some like cultists who were harassing some civilians that are tied up or uh, I got ambushed by vampires, you know, um, or, or an NPC gave me a little side mission to go check out. Um, there's always something along the way that just like pulls me off the, off the beaten path um, to, to check something out or discover something or loot something. Uh, and that's just tremendously fun. I'm thankful every day for like Arcane is a company where some of us have worked together for 20 plus years or 10 years or you know and there's a lot of cement there socially and a lot of creative chemistry and uh, even though some people have left and new people have joined us and all that it's been uh, it's been a blessing to have this team and this game and the company culture and we're in it together we're gonna get through this we're gonna ship our game no matter what uh, no matter what virus hits us or whatever you know so uh, but during this last few years it's been a, a blessing. Yeah.